Hey everybody, welcome back. In today's episode of Raising Unicorns, before you invest thousands of dollars in your video script, test out your visual concept with an animatic first. You don't have to be a unicorn to catch the magic of a great business. Harlan Brothers has helped countless companies, both big and small, grow into the businesses they were meant to be. Here on Raising Unicorns, we share the marketing secrets we've learned to help you raise your business by hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions of dollars and beyond. Welcome back, everybody, to the Raising Unicorns podcast. Today, we have the one, the only, Caitlin freaking Snow on the podcast. <laughs> that is me. Boom! Boom! There is one Caitlin Snow in The Flash. She's the bad guy, but that's not the one that's Is that here like her today. actual name or is that her character name on the show? The character name on the show. Okay, got it, got yeah. it. So we're talking about a real life person, yeah. Caitlin Snow, who's the wizard CD the and editor that is not in The Flash. <laughs> <laughs> is with us here today. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard podcasts with Caitlin on before, she is a creative director here at Harmon Brothers. She's the executive creative director. She is also one of our longtime members of the family. Mm -hmm. She's the original Harmon Brother and sister. First adoptee, I think. She was the first Harmon sister. <laughs> Caitlin came up on the editing side of the creative process and was really instrumental on very many of the early campaigns, pretty much all of them, with Squatty Potty, Purple, Chatbooks, you know, you name it. She's done almost all of our biggest campaigns, I would say. Would that be fair mm -hmm. to say, Caitlin? Yeah. She knows a thing or two about creativity as well as editing. And we're going to talk a little bit about editing today. We are known for these really big campaigns that have a lot of crazy elements in them, throwing cars off cliffs, pooping unicorns, making a tree person not look horrifying, and also travel to Paris. Mm -hmm. Filling with bears. Forgot that one. My favorite. Rest in peace, Bart. Bears, kids, and food. Bears, you did kids, all those and food. in one, <laughs> one, one ad. And it was <laughs> amazing. I don't know what all these directors are complaining about. It was so much fun. And stunts. I did stunts. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that is so important for us and a lot of our processes for creative is making mistakes as early as possible. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who've read the book Creativity Inc., this is a big thing that we've adopted from the creative brains behind Pixar. And basically the idea is that you want to fail as fast and as early as possible in the creative process because the earlier you can fail and course correct in that process, the easier it's going to be to get to a better end product as well as it's going to save you time time, money, and mm -hmm. energy. It's essentially like a minimum viable product yes. in business, right? Let's go down this path and quickly see if this is the right path to go down. Obviously, we do a lot of that in like the scripting process and the writing process itself with our treats where we really focus in on like nailing the messaging, nailing the script, getting the language and humor down. One thing that is a big part of our process, if you follow Harm Brothers, you know about our writing retreat process. I think that's the thing that you see in a lot of behind the scenes videos. And we've talked about it a lot on podcasts. But one of the things that we really haven't talked about that's been a pretty instrumental tool for us over the years is actually designing an animatic for our ads. Mm -hmm. But what's an animatic, I should say, for those in the audience who don't know, Caitlin, would you like to inform the audience and explain what an animatic yes, is? Yes, please. We work with an artist and make storyboards for the ad and we edit it together. So it's almost like a, a cartoon without the animation. It's like stop motion cartoon, essentially, of the, the three minute ad that we would be doing. With Lumi, we saw like like the French woman on stage. We saw her in a bathroom. I've been on some for like a keto chow commercial, the first zero res commercial. Yeah, we essentially like get voiceover beforehand and images to put together and, and see if it's making sense to people. We try to like make the jokes work, a little storyboard. It's a very interesting thing. And I think some writers <laughs> have been like get so annoyed when I say this. Kellen, I know you're maybe listening. So I'm sorry. There is some interesting elements that don't translate when you're at a script read at a retreat and the energy in that script read works super, super well. And sometimes it doesn't translate to set necessarily the same way that it did at the retreat. Right, um, which we would find out, but it would be months later yeah. before we did the animatic. Exactly. Right? That's a really painful thing if you don't really fully vet something. But the animatic is a really good tool to pressure test these mm -hmm. jokes and see if they actually work. Part of it is we have such great writers and they're such great comedians. They know how to deliver really good stuff and they know how to exactly like get that joke to sing and some actors just can't. And so sometimes it's really helpful to get in the animatic process because usually you're using Scratch Audio, not like amazing, you know, talent. It's often us. 
We are well, yeah. <laughs> it's usually us, but also like the writers who pitched it at the retreat. Yeah, that's because true. Because they're like really aware of the characters and kind of the intention of it. But yeah, it's not on set. LA sound booth. Yeah. really nice. What that allows you to do is put that audio in there and see if it works outside of the context of that really fun energy at the retreat. Oftentimes, it's not. We have to scrap this joke. It's more like, oh, something's off, mm -hmm. like ever so slightly. Like, what is it about it? And I feel like it allows you to kind of feel out the rhythm of the joke a little bit better. It allows you feel like how it's flowing within the actual context of the ad now that there's not all this exposition and stage direction being read in the scripting process and mm -hmm. it's just the actual actions and dialogue that would be seen in the final ad. And so it allows you to parse out what's wrong. There's entire jokes in the animatic process that I know on my projects, we've just scrapped. This is distracting. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, it's not hitting nearly as hard as it should for how much time it's taking in the edit. And so we just have to make that decision. Okay, it's gone. Because if it's not driving the sale, it's not entertaining or such a a haymaker humor moment that's going to be super sticky and memorable. If it doesn't meet either one of those thresholds, it's got to get out of here, mm -hmm. right? I've also seen when we did the Keto Chow Rapunzel ad, there's a hook where you see Rapunzel eating and then all of a sudden she flies out of frame and it's because the prince down below the tower pulled on her hair and so... Because he's fat. <laughs> yes, because he's not on the keto diet. <laughs> and so essentially there were shots consisting of her flying out of frame, essentially like being pulled and then the next shot is her bracing herself in the window so she's not falling. Those were shots that we had to play around with and in the animatic to see if the timing worked and like if it made sense. And it was actually really helpful because then we knew how we had to do the stunt to get the, the shots that we needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That was really nice. It also helps me as a director because you'll notice when you're watching the animatic, like, oh, I want to be in closer. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not seeing what I want to see right now, you know, or you can feel disoriented. Like, where am I? Like, I need to see the setting. It also helps you realize what's missing that the audience needs that mm -hmm. you can then film instead of find out after the fact, after you've shot everything. I think there's some directors that don't need an animatic because they just are visual thinkers. I already know exactly how this thing is going to play out shot by shot. But I think for a lot of people and a lot of creatives, it's a really healthy exercise as you're going through and working with a storyboard artist. You have to basically envision how you're going to shoot this. And it's essentially creating a shot list of sorts where you're saying, I need mm -hmm. to see it from this length at this distance, or we need to be able to see this product here or this demonstration here, or it has to be the blocking between these two characters here for this comedic beat so we can reveal something here. And it makes you think about it in a way that it's really, really helpful because it helps you problem solve exactly like what we need to do or how we need to stage things in a way that's even when I'm going through and doing a shot list, if I don't have that animatic, it's hard for me to really get there without visually seeing it. For this most recent one that I did for Kodiak Cakes, mm -hmm. I worked with May Sorensen, one of our creative directors. I was a creative director. He was the director on this project. We didn't have a budget for this one because it was a crazy quick turnaround. We didn't have budget or time. We had to do the whole pre-production in like a month just because it was going to snow. And we're like, we got to shoot. And it hasn't stopped snowing. It literally started snowing in October. We shot in September and it has not stopped snowing. And since it's October. Yeah. And it's freaking March. It's mm -hmm. been a bonkers year. So I'm glad we got it. But going back to the point of my story, even though we didn't have a storyboard artist, Mace and I had really put an emphasis of like, we need to make sure we know exactly where everything's blocked out. We mm -hmm. need to have our locations. And Mace was really smart. And he took a bunch of photos of the locations because we had a lot of these on lock already. And then just took them and sketched on top of those with different framings and zoomed in on oh, them. Sweet. And so he had used the actual photos from the location scout as his backdrop to really simplify it. Same like thing with food shots and some of the special shots, we had experimented and actually shot some stuff with our phone and like mm -hmm. prototyped it. So then we knew exactly what we were getting into. And we had a lot more information to give to our different departments to kind of convey Mace's vision of what he wanted in the different areas. The reason I bring this up, this was a relatively cheap expenditure compared to hiring a storyboard artist. It's going to cost a couple thousand dollars to get 70, 80 boards done and then ha hiring an editor to go in and do this. Like For just, a week or two. Yeah, and then, yeah, really dialing it in. Just having this dialed out with the animatic on a very simple form. A director could throw this into Premiere and just basically work through it and get a lot of benefit out of it. It doesn't have to be crazy expensive, is my point. And it can get a lot of insight and helpful things out of the learning process of going through building that out yourself. And by the way, the illustrations do not have to look great. Yeah. They yeah. were... <laughs> I wish I could show you some. Just imagine like six-year-old, like just drawing. And that was Mace's drawing. Not a prodigy. Just like a normal first grader who kind of sucks at drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a storyboard artist. And I think too, even if you do go the hire an artist and like that whole route with editing, we've even fallen into the trap of trying to make the animatic perfect, mm -hmm. which is not its job. You get the learnings from it because there came a time in the process where, okay, there's things I would change in the animatic, but instead of changing them, like 
if you know that they're the right solutions, you just start implementing that in the production. So I like what you said that, hey, if you don't have to dedicate a ton of time and money. You can do stuff with your phone. Or you can do draw overs. But even in the process of the animatic, it's not supposed to be this full-blown pretty thing at the end. It's yeah. just to teach you what you need. Just expanding on that a little bit. We did this campaign for Avast, which is an antivirus company. It was, again, a big hero. And we were trying to prototype some of the shots that we needed for this hook. We were trying to figure it out. We didn't know exactly where we were shooting yet. And then like we found out our location very last minute. I think it was after the animatic had already been done. And so Ryan Powell, one of our directors here, he was the director. I was the creative director on it. And we went and just took our phones and just blocked it out in, in our office and just had me be the camera operator and Ryan be one of the actors and like just like took a, a group of three of us. Mm -hmm. And just like blocked this whole scene out, which totally changed how we actually filmed it in the end. You can do so much even just through like your phone, mm -hmm. especially if you get a little DJI mobile gimbal kind of thing. You can actually make it look pretty decent. You could even get to a polish level where you could show conceptually to like a client, hey, this is how we're thinking this motion is going to play out with this opening sequence or this really complex area to kind of give you a vision of what's going to happen. Because oftentimes the animatic is not only for our benefit and kind of budget saving areas and kind of flushing out things, but it's it's also really beneficial for the client to see that like you're taking a lot of care to understand how the, the shot's going to look. I see their vision for what they're doing. They've got a really great thing going on here. This is encouraging. I'm excited to see the real thing on production. So it's another thing to build trust with them and, and also like as the actual creators working through what needs to be done and what's missing. I've never shown a client an animatic, I don't think. What was the thing that made you show it, if that makes sense, to help them alleviate a concern or explain a, an idea to them? I'm trying to remember who the last one I showed it to. I think I did show the original Kodiak Cakes one to them. So I have shown the animatic to a client. And usually I try and do it on a bigger budget where I can have a little bit more polish. Mm -hmm. Some clients know how to use their imagination and have the vision for what you're talking about. I don't think it's anything against the individual clients or the people who don't. Some just don't have that. I can't see it till I see it. If it's a client like that, I try and have a decently polished like animatic that feels tight. Especially when they're working with us hard. But there's some of these campaigns are hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, that they're working with us on. And it's a big investment. If we can get a good joke to land, we can show them the flow of it. If it has like some music to it, they can kind of get a little bit more taste and flavor for what this final production is going to be like. And we can show the comedy working outside of the retreat. And it's like, it starts to come to life a little bit more. I think it can be more reassuring to them. And Kodiak Cakes was the last animatic that I shared with them. And again, it's just... The first Kodiak Cakes. The very Cakes. first Kodiak Cakes commercial we did. They were a brand that was very established and they've got a really strong, beautiful brand identity mm -hmm. that they've worked really hard to cultivate over the years and to distinguish themselves in the marketplace from other breakfast offerings. They stand out like a sore thumb in the best way possible just because they're so unique and they have such a cool look to them. Mm -hmm. I think they trusted us because of our track record, but I also think that they were like, hey, you've never worked with someone who has such a distinctive brand and feel. We want to make sure you are hitting this right mm -hmm. and it's not, it doesn't feel like an off-brand version of, pardon the pun, but the on off brand version of Kodiak. I feel comfortable saying this. Like that's one thing they've been very nice to Harm Brothers about in seeing our praises that we understand the brand and we took our time. And that was just another way that we kind of gained their confidence of being able to show them like this is what it's going to look like in animatic form. This is kind of the direction we're going in the feel. It's just another tool to build confidence with, mm -hmm. the, with the clients if you have it. I was trying to think of an example of how an animatic has saved us money because that's ultimately like yeah. we talked about what you opened up on the podcast. They can save you from really painful mistakes if you catch those mistakes earlier on versus having them go later. I mean, I can think of two things that influenced how we approached the shoot. I don't know how that converted into dollars. Well, actually, okay, I think one was zero res. And we've talked about this with the Brain Trust, mm -hmm. where when we came back from the retreat, we'll read the scripts. And zero res is a carpet cleaning company. And we had a woman pitch person and then a male customer. And it was kind of within the Brain Trust and the animatic process where we realized that those roles should be switched. If you recall, we realized like their main customer is a woman who's kind of in charge of the house and the family finances, scheduling the appointments. And so we changed it to have a woman be the customer. And then we wanted to kind of also hit all the demographics. So we, we had a male spokesperson. That was like a casting change. And luckily we were in pre-production. And so we were able to do that. That's something that would have been very hard. To, we would have just had to reshoot the whole thing <laughs> if it was <laughs> after the say? fact. Uh, we should switch, you know. Switch genders Switch of the roles. Yeah. I don't know if that would be very hard or impossible. <laughs> 
So that was one where right away, and I think that was kind of working in tandem with the brain trust, but some of that was seeing the script translate Mm -hmm. visually into the animatic. And they're like, women would relate more to a woman customer. Another one I think of is the second Lumi campaign we did where it was a town. Lumi works for any type of person. For that one, it was fun, a little bit of a creative stretch because the musical numbers weren't filmed or edited like our normal pitch videos. And we figured that out in the animatic that longer flowing camera moves were better to show grandiose musicality and theatricalness of it all. And so we realized we don't need to get five different angles for this one shot that, you know, this line in the song, we actually kind of put our eggs in one basket, but we felt confident these are entertaining shots and we don't have to like overkill it on our shot list, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that was helpful. And also we did have feedback when people saw the animatic. They're like, okay, you're navel gazing a little too much. There's too many wide shots that are like trying to be all spectacular. So it was also helpful for us to be like, okay, so as much as we want to go the theatrical route, we have to also make sure we're in close on the people, on the product. Yeah, that one was uh, a big scope. We had like a cast of like 25 people. Every second on set cost a lot of money and we were working on like the choreography, but it was on set, but it was really helpful to already have those camera moves dialed in and know that this is what's going to translate the best and we don't have to get all this different coverage. Yeah, I remember when we were working on Camp Chef back in the day, we had made it animatic. Our approach with the main video was to sell a camp chef as a smoker as like the lead product of like be the band-aid of the category where it just takes ownership of the category. And camp chef wanted to really have a video that was chocked full of stuff that was very much so about the differentiation of the product and how it stood out against like something like Traeger's or Rectech or Green Egg. They wanted to like put a bunch of this stuff into the main script. And eventually in the animatic process, we realized this is too much and it's too all over the place. We need to pick a lane. And so what we ended up doing is actually pulling those into two completely separate videos and separating them early on. So we didn't get into post-production and be like, oh, we just got to shelve all this stuff. But it was allowed us to like actually pull them into two different scripts, rewrite things so it could be a, its own standalone mm-hmm. script, not just dilapidated pieces of the script that we cut because it didn't fit in the editing room. Because a lot of that stuff, if it's not rewritten to be its own standalone piece of content, just ends up being on going by the wayside. It's a total yeah. waste. The two videos did really, really well because one was broadening the market and going for new consumers who would never really consider a smoker. I think it was interesting because that one video did really well of talking to new customers and bringing them into the world of pellet-based smokers. And then the other one talked to more of the people who are like already in the pellet world, were pretty far in like the decision-making process, mm-hmm. comparing Traegers versus Camp Chefs versus Rectex and seeing like, which one do I want? That one did really, really well on retargeting yeah. and really cleaning house on like getting those people to sign because of some of the differentiation that their product had. So it ended up being really beneficial by kind of stratifying our video across multiple different audiences. That, yeah, and different um, parts of the funnel too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If we hadn't done the animatic, I think a lot of that would have been lost on some degree and it wouldn't have felt two different cohesive videos like, targeting two different people. It would have just kind of felt like a mashed mess that we probably would have ended up cutting 30% of the and, second video. Yeah, and anything that wasn't cut would have probably just diluted and made the main video not as strong Yeah, because really you want to be able to get in and say, what you know, if you say what three you things, to. you're not saying yeah. anything, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that one was already a very long Oh my gosh, it was so long. It's like like four minutes. Yeah. So I edited that one and the first rough cut was like (laughs) six and a half minutes long. Yeah. That wasn't like a bad edit either as far as pacing, but it's just so much. It was a ton. I mean, that's the thing too. And we were trying to take somewhere from zero information about smoking pellet grills sold. It was a lot. That's awesome that, that the animatic was able like so early to say, okay, let's put this content in a different video. Yeah. And plan better. Yeah. And so the final product was better for Camp Chef. And they were able to generate, you know, a tremendous amount of revenue off of that video um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like, I don't know if we have permission to say this, but I know we can for sure say that those two videos and that campaign in general generated millions of sales in a category that was relatively small. Well, um, Tom, who's who's been with us for a while, Adbind, he used to work at Camp Chef and Mm -hmm. he brings it up often. He's like, I just want another comparison video, like the Woodwind Camp Chef grill, (laughs) you know, like. Because he he saw the effects of it. Leverage that thing like, crazy. It did really well for him. To wrap this up a little bit, when would you use, and we've kind of talked about these almost interchangeably, but when would you use in your own creative process, a storyboard versus a animatic? 
the campaign that I'm working on now, which is Sash Bag, what I want to do is bring some different images that I have in mind into shot listing with the DP and actually work on storyboards then instead of an animatic. Because I think that the one downside I've seen with the animatic is I do it without the collaboration of the director of photography. And they often have... Often, strong they opinions. Always, well, not just strong opinions, but they can come Great up ideas. with cooler shots than I can. So I want to make that more collaborative. And really, I think that it's the visuals that I really want to emphasize in this campaign. And so if I can come in and say, here's these five different visuals that are like must-haves, but here's the scenes that are going on, how would you show that? And I just want to make sure that I'm shot listing in a way that can provide interesting and various images to use for like intro testing. Mm -hmm. I think the downside of the animatic is that you look at it as one long video, Mm -hmm. like a three-minute ad, whereas we want to be able to be so modular that it's the pieces that are more important than the whole. So I kind of just want to look at it more as the pieces. And that's where I think that just storyboards will be helpful. And then know that, okay, here's all of our pieces that we can mix around to make a video. So I have lots of confidence in our editorial and stuff. So I'm not as worried about pacing and jokes in that in that way for yeah. this campaign. Yeah, I think I'm going to be leaning more on... Story Wars. Yeah. I think the animatic is most beneficial when you're trying to like get the full picture of how this full video will feel and it's closest you can without filming it. And how, how the flow, how the pacing, how the jokes play together. Because that's another thing we see when we do animatics. Sometimes we're like, ooh, this joke is too similar and it feels like there's three of this type of joke. Mm-hmm. We need to get an alt here so it breaks it up and keeps it fresh so it doesn't feel too repetitive or doesn't feel original enough. That's like a really good example. of You see the whole picture and how everything plays together. I think storyboards are most useful, especially for like complex visuals that are hard to describe in the written word and actually being able to sit down with an artist and talk through how this will work and how you imagine the camera movement working. If nothing else, to convey to the other crew members how to pull this off. I remember with Coven and I that we did an action sequence that was like very rapid succession of cuts. The stunt coordinator was not really necessarily understanding how this would cut together or how we would shoot this. And so that was one thing that was helpful when we went through and did all the storyboards on that one was really laying out, here's the different three different shots that we really are going to be doing on each of these vignettes for these superheroes. It was super helpful. Yeah, because then they could see it. They can like, oh, I get it now. This would be actually cool if you jumped off this thing instead of this thing. Or like, what if we did it this way? So like you were saying with the director of photography, the boards can spur additional ideas of, oh, this would be cool if we did it this way or like what if you shot it like this or what if we had the action go this way so I think it's a really good collaborative tool of both conveying your vision and also mining good ideas for really great people you hire in to work on the production Mm -hmm. it's very helpful to have something to show the department heads on the other side we have had where it's like here's the animatic and then if it's not in the animatic they don't do it even if it's in the script and that's just I mean honestly lack of communication on our part once I saw that happening then I was very clear the animatic is not the bible you know this is the script is the bible (laughs) It is the written word. (laughs) You know, it's like a picture is worth a thousand words, right? It can really help have a baseline for people to catch the vision of, oh, this is what you're going for. So basically to summarize this up, animatics can be an incredibly useful tool for rooting out really fundamental problems within a script or within a, a, a series of jokes and getting those corrected earlier, which is always less expensive and, might I add, less stressful. Another element that animatics are super helpful for is really feeling, getting the flow Mm -hmm. of how your final product will feel. And then lastly, just even storyboards and animatics in general are both very effective at conveying a vision of what you have as a director to all the different people around you. Because as everybody knows, commercial work or film work, it's all such a collaborative endeavor that needs to have a lot of really talented people to come together to produce something great. And if it's not clearly conveyed from the director and the vision that they have to the other departments, it's not going to come together as well. So if you utilize tools like an animatic or storyboards, your vision and like the collaboration can be so much higher and in the end, generate a far better result with those than if you hadn't. Nice. Tired of playing catch up on your marketing approach? Plan your whole year of ad content with our video strategy in a day. The Harmon Brothers are known for their ad work with Lumi, Purple, and Skull Shaver. And now we're offering a 20 minute video that helps you strategize your best profit pushing ad research, messaging, and testing for free. Because a win for great businesses is a win for all of us. Go to harmonbrothers.com forward slash video strategy to save future you a lot of stress with no pitch and nothing to buy.